Hi, welcome to this, I believe, fourth session on Shrems 2 uh, that we've been doing here at Open Security Summit. We've been doing them across the last couple of months. And this is January 2021, just from an historical point of view, I think the date is actually important. And, um, and I, on, on the last session, we, we talked a lot about the, um, the sort of impact of the ruling, the, some of the side effects, the, the problems that it causes. We actually look at some very interesting solutions on from a technical point of view that could be put in place to start, start to you know, protect the data and to start thinking about even data citizenship and, and, and safe almost, I actually we talk about safe harbors almost, right? But more in a physical sense in, a, in to protect. What we didn't know in December, which is what we know now, is that we now have the big variable, which was the Brexit. So it has occurred, it has, it went almost to the last minute, but it, you know, eventually it happened. So I think that would be a good place to start, which is sort of what, what do we know? And, and, and I think maybe a good way area to look forward is what is the information and what we want to know in the next couple of months. And we will maybe start to capture you know, a number of questions that we can then follow up. So then when we do another session in a month from now, we can kind of see um, the, the, the outcome. Um, there's actually a really amazing document that, you know, Adam, well, we can't be here today, but he created while we actually went in the last session, which I highly advise to take a look. But I think on this one, I've, I think we have enough meat on the bone just to try to understand what's going to happen in the UK and how that's going to impact. And again, the whole relationship with the EU and, and some of the scenarios that we, we should be able to unpick in the next hour or so. So, David, can I pass um, the maybe... Uh, just introduce yourself and then um, you know give us a bit of what you know about the current situation. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Dennis. Uh, yeah, David Clark, I've got a background in dealing with cybersecurity generally for uh, large global com companies, and obviously the last five or six years been focused as well on uh, data protection as it it's kind of gradually kind of well it has come of age and it's come of age big time. And um, yeah, kind of going to Brexit, the, the, what we from understand from Brexit is that pretty much at the moment, nothing has changed. And uh, we've pretty much got six months to kind of finalize the details of what that might look like. And, uh, you know, will that be kind of adequacy or, or something else? Uh, and, you know, what do we need to do to be prepared for that? And I think the guidance that we've kind of seen so far probably still not 100% clear because there are loads of kind of spin-offs and you know we were just kind of talking earlier what adequacy means but does it kind of really mean the same you know if, if we were Argentina do we kind of have the same kind of rights as being part of the GDPR kind of European club or will we be seen as adequate but kind of outsiders and uh, kind of still need to modify you know many of our kind of bits of legislation and practices and cope with every country differently. Sarah, do you want to give an intro to you and then chip in? Sure. Um, I'm Sarah Clark. Much like David, I came from a cybersecurity background with a lot of data-focused security then into data protection. And uh, I'm based in the UK as well. So the Brexit data protection thing is very close to my heart too. We're, we're not related. Yeah. And we're not related. No, we're not related. We're just there's lots of clerks everywhere, everywhere. I was in a class at school with three other Sarahs and there were two Sarah clerks in my school. So, yeah. Um, but from this point of view, we've we've had this stay of execution with the four month extension on continuing the free flow of data and sort of pre-existing conditions for the UK. Um, we have a precise lift and drop of the GDPR into UK law. So we have the UK GDPR. So from here on, I'm to referring to as the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR, still with the Data Protection Act 2018, which is all of the country specific exceptions that all countries were um, allowed to make if they wanted to, to elements like for their own law enforcement purposes or their own education and public service purposes. Um, so that also still applies. Um, what we're all waiting to see with the noises that are being made around a review of the Human Rights Act in the UK, for instance, and that we really don't have a lot that we can shout about in terms of doing less surveillance than the states, um, about how that will shake down between now and those six months. Um, 
the three scenarios as David suggested is, you know, if we get onto an adequacy footing, then for the purpose of data transfers, we shouldn't need um, any of the article 46 tools to transfer data over to us, although it doesn't stop you having to do due diligence. Um, and if we get it wrong, we can, we can still be come after in the same way that you have recourse to a statutory supervisory authority if you're in the, in the European Union. Um, uh, or we're not going to have an adequacy agreement and we're going to have to use SECs or some other Article 46 thing with or without supplementary measures to an extent we don't know yet. Um, and or there might be a privacy shield type compromise. I very jokingly said privacy bin lid. Um, it had the right kind of dystopian riot theme feel to it, but um, I, all joking aside, we may have a compromise like that because it's hard to see how Europe can stand by its data protection principles and grant us a free and full adequacy agreement right now. Mark, over to you. So hi everybody, my name is Mark Potkowitz. Uh, I'm an American lawyer and I have to give the caveat that nothing I say here shall be construed as legal advice and my views are my own and not the institution where I work, which is Ulster University where I'm the director of the Legal Innovation Center. And um, uh, as an American living in the UK now, especially in Northern Ireland, um, the implications on data privacy and other things around Brexit are fascinating. And like everybody else here, I'm eager to see what actually comes of this with respect to how it's treated, how cross-border data transfer is treated, especially in a jurisdiction which will share the only UK land border with the European Union. A lot of people in Northern Ireland live in Ireland and work in Northern Ireland and vice versa. A lot of businesses operate both in the Republic of Ireland and in the UK. And so part of my interest in this is to see how we can kind of game this and how it's going to play out with respect to the various types of agreements and additional considerations that come into play. Yeah, so, so I think the, the, the interesting question now is that when we look at you know, the, the strengths to ruling, right? How, how is that going to apply on this? Because that was an European Union actual decision, right? It's a European decision, European Union decision that applies specifically to countries that are lacking an adequacy agreement. Yeah. Uh, so they become what we've termed as third countries. We suspected, well, without this extension, then the UK would have become a third country as of the 1st of January, mm -hmm. without an adequacy agreement or a compromise like Privacy Shield. At the moment, we are we're like quantum adequacy. <laughs> we, 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 are, we are out of the EU, but we are still being treated as if we were a member. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Schrems applies to us if we don't get an adequacy agreement or a compromise that puts us out with the ruling of Schrems. And, and is, is that, even when you look at the next couple of years, you know, is that, can, can that change reasonably quickly? I have to ask Max. No, mm -hmm. I, 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 I I feel that if we get some compromise like Privacy Shield, I think Max Schrems would come after that ruling on the same basis he came after the States. Um, I think we'd probably have a court case log the next day um, because um, I think he would view SCCs as insufficient to um, produce essential equivalence in the protections in the UK in the same way that he viewed that in, in the States. So I think we have to view the potential solutions we have to view we have to pre prepare for the worst and be pleased with the best we cannot have uh, <coughs> we cannot ignore the need for a contingency for six months time that would be the same as we're working up for the state so um, the i have a so go on. um i have a question but this is probably a very simple question um so uk and eu i understand that bit but with with brexit happening how is it with UK and US now? So UK have the UK GDPR apply. Mm. We are deeming any countries that the EU gave an adequacy agreement okay. to as also adequate from our point of view. I think maybe with one exception, that's something I'd need to check. Um, I think it's all of them. Um, so by that yardstick, the UK is also going to be demanding the same level of protection from the US. But 
the Schrems 2 ruling doesn't apply to those data transfers because, as Dennis correctly pointed out, that was a judgment about sending EU residence data to the US and the UK populace are no longer EU residents. So there's no lack of headaches here. There could be overlap though, couldn't there? Because we could be kind of managing French data as yes. part of the business. Yes. Yes, so there is ongoing transfer. There's where we are a stepping stone between the EU and the uh, US is one scenario. There's also where um, we are um, looking after EU residents in our own right, sitting within as companies within the UK, which is very, as highly likely, as you say, obviously Irish residents, for instance. Um, so it, the easiest way to consider this is to is to plan for the same contingency. Everybody who we've been advising, I know you'll be the same, David. We've been saying, if you've had any option, if you're changing contract terms, get into SCCs now. Don't don't wait to see. Um, yeah, a lot of companies are just doing that anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, okay. and they're going to change as well. Have they approved those draft ones? I know they were going to. No, they're not. I, as far as I know, I I had just checked again the other day, but I don't think they're out yeah, yet. Yeah, I hadn't seen it either. Yeah. No, I don't think they're out yet. But they know the draft. The consultation ended on the tenth of December. Um, they asked for longer, so I need to double check whether it was extended. Um, but they're all out there in draft. Um, but they've, they've extended for a year the application of the old version of the SCC, is one that still applies to the Data Protection Directive. Um, so the predecessor to the GDPR. Um, but you're going to have to go onto the new SCCs for anything new you sign up to between now and once they're out, between when they come out and when the old ones cease to be mm -hmm. useful. So, so what's kind of the, the worst case scenario? Right? It is the case where we cannot host data from um, European customers? Uh, it's going to be the basis that the European companies place upon us as conditions for us being able to host the data they send us. Um, or if we go out seeking business in Europe, we're going to have to prove that we've got adequate protections in place. So right now, we don't have to do anything more than we've been doing historically. There's no legal requirement to do anything different. But what people are going to want from, from UK companies expecting to host EU data is they're going to want a plan. They're going to want us to have done a transfer impact assessment, which is actually a, a requirement in the new rules. Um, and they're going to want us to be on standby to talk about supplementary measures if we end up with that adequacy. So if we if we host the data in a European data center, would that make it simple? If you're hosting European residence data in the European data center, that would improve matters. But you still have that scenario I listened to you talking about last time. Yeah. Where if you're needing to work on that data there, if you're needing to access it, even if you're sitting there with a virtual machine. Yeah. You're still going to need to refer to the regulations yeah and, and aren't, haven't we still got the same kind of issue it's a big us company and they're under fiso and cloudwatch act or whatever um it doesn't really matter where they are in the world yes sorry yeah i was taking it as a um as a uk company hosting in europe in order to be able to more safely host sure. european data but yeah absolutely if you've got even if that is the scenario if you've got if you're hosting on aws even though you are headquartered in the UK with your hosting provider for your hybrid solution in um, the EU, if there's an American service element in the mix, you've still got to allow for that. If there's any- And I, I was addresses. kind of wondering whether there's kind of an extra threat, uh, you know, where AWS kicked off Parler, for example, you know, could that become more widespread and they go, you know what, we don't want kind of certain rivals and, and just kick them off the service. And, and, that, and that was a combined thing from the big three main tech companies that actually you, you could be destroyed overnight if you fall out of favour. It's so hard not to say something political right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well, well, I, I might be able to jump in here and say, well, one of the issues in the United States uh, about this intermediary liability stuff relates to 
uh, kind of a pair of lead statutes. Um, one really isn't at issue here, which is Digital Millennium Copyright Act Section 512. The one that is at issue is Communications Decency Act Section 230 and it's kind of corollaries codicils in the way that it's been expanded. And broadly speaking, if a platform doesn't discriminate against certain viewpoints, or rather doesn't exercise editorial control, it isn't necessarily seen as a speaker or publisher of the content for the purposes of liability, which is one of the reasons why Twitter necessarily can't proactively censor or edit um, tweets without somebody first complaining, unless it is proactively enforcing its terms of use. So when it comes to something like Amazon Web Services, um, they wouldn't be themselves held liable for content that was being hosted on an AWS server so long as they weren't necessarily interfering with it. But on the corollary, depending on what their terms of use say, they probably reserve the right to kick people off the system for okay. violating those terms, which could be related to things like inciting violence or violating certain laws. The question which is gonna happen in the courts is one, whether or not the use of this power would fall under kind of antitrust Parliament is trying to do from a litigation perspective, or whether or not this type of um, behavior can be seen or argued as not necessarily content neutral, which could then create an issue of whether or not they would lose this privacy, not this privacy, rather, I shouldn't use that word carelessly, lose this safe harbor protection under CDA 230 type frameworks. And, the, uh, and on a side note, if they begin to go in this direction, there's a risk to these private companies that these things begin becoming regulated like common carriers. Thanks for that, because I, I think e even the best people I know get struggle with 230. AWS is a common carrier. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, my, my connection cut out for a second. I missed that, yeah. sorry. What yeah. was that? Yeah. I just said thank you for that, because even the best people oh. I know are getting confused about 230 with all the various takes on it. So that's really helpful. Yeah, so the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, Section 512, is essentially CDA 230, but for copyrighted content. So the reason YouTube isn't sued into oblivion every time somebody posts a clip from Marvel's Avengers series is because DMCA 512 uh, protects them mm. from that uh, early presidential case has to do with um, Prince, you know, the, the musician Prince, a woman put a video online of her toddler dancing to a Prince song and the right holders of the Prince song went after them for posting this infringing content, which then kind of helped spawn this and there's the notice and takedown provision. There's also some peculiar corollaries to that where companies are alleging DMCA 512 stuff to get content taken off, which is later um, found not to be infringing. Um, and so there's a whole separate issue on that. But anyway, um, this idea of things being kicked off to my mind speaks to a kind of a different issue than the Schrems 2 related kind of privacy issue here. Well, availability is a privacy issue. So suddenly you can't access your data. You're, you're kind of caught. Right. And again, I'm sorry. I'm not to try to disconnect and reconnect to get a better connection. But I was going to say that the question does that. What, what does happen to that data? So let's say that I'm somebody who's using AWS and all of a sudden I no longer have access to it. But then somebody uh, who is uh, not happy with something, for likely the thing that got me kicked off AWS in the first place, uh, sends a uh, Article 17 right to be forgotten. And I can now no longer access that data because it's somehow in suspended animation over this. Yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a good one, right? It is. Yeah, because the, the, the thing about, you know, even the, late, the latest moves, right? Um, one of the questions I had on that one was, that doesn't a lot of it is falling into the terms of services for these companies, right? Because they can say that, you know, you, you cannot incite violence or you cannot, you know, there are certain things that you're not supposed to do, right? If you break that, you break it in terms of services of a private company, right? And a private company can determine what happens in their platform, right? Yeah, you would think so. But in that case, why aren't ISPs doing it? And that's because they're kind of much very heavily regulated as well. Otherwise, they'd be kicking people off even more than they normally do. And normally it requires some kind of government initiative to kick someone off. And I think in Belgium, their plan is that if companies are not going to be compliant with uh, data protection, they will eventually arrange for them to be taken out of the DNS service. So it kind of seems to ha only happen at a, a more of a government level. Um, what's it, the 2000 Digital Economy Act? You know, we, we, we kind of then ISPs kind of then blocked access to sites where you could watch, you know, Bruce Willis movies for free or whatever. Um, it, but, but this is not coming from government. This is coming from kind of from 
private companies who kind of decide who's who's kind of fit for purpose and kind of do you remember when the patriot act was kind of in force it was really you know very few i don't know any kind of government department councils who would then kind of use cloud services because they were worried about the patriot act and you know no matter what you did it was like you know this this is not going to happen here uh, and until that faded away so are we mm -hmm. kind of gradually moving back to a, a version of the patriot act where actually we can't be certain that another country can affect our our infrastructure I've also seen an argument as well. We're at a place in the evolution of these public spaces on the internet where somebody um, put forward the idea of a semi-public square because neither argument seems to work that either it's somewhere that everybody should have access to because it's a forum that people have had their rights infringed if they cannot access it because it's so powerful to be able to interact and organize and, and hear the full range of opinions, et cetera. You know, is there an, a transference of your rights to a public square onto these big space, open spaces on the Internet, relatively open spaces on the Internet? By the, the other counter argument is they are private companies. Their word is law. They can get rid of who they like. And I think that, that we are heading towards, I think, an evolution into statute law of a natural law that's evolved in terms of how it's treated, how it's viewed, how possessive we feel about being able to access that. Because we all know that the um, algorithmic acceleration and the paid for spread um, and the artificial atomization of groups into tiny micro defined interest elements that make them easier to find who's malleable and target, those pay to play elements of it have taken it out of the public open space realms from my perspective. That needs to be, that, that needs to be a more equitable thing you can't have just the powers that be that can launch very well targeted influence campaigns but at the same time you can have massive organic spread that naturally occurs in these spaces that that's why they grew why somebody found better ways to monetize that capability should we do we want to retain that so somebody like Cory Doctorow's position is you need to bring antitrust into play to make them small enough to regulate at the moment the means to limit that control of the speed and speed of spread and influence the capability of these platforms. Um, the only way you can monitor it is to give them, ask them to monitor it, monitor it for you because they're the only ones who've got the tools to monitor something that's as big as them. And then you really have got a too big to fail scenario. So but that's that's almost into the philosophy of the internet space there. I'm not sure how helpful it is for practical solutions right now. I, th I think the, the, the interesting element is, is actually a symmetry of information, right? So if you look at, if you're sitting on a platform, right, you, you have access to a wealth of data, right, on almost the authenticity of your players, right? And, and I feel that one of the problems we had here was that these platforms were caught with a very, you know, interesting dilemma, which is they actually made a huge amount of money, right, by these non, almost human players, right, or this abuse of the system that, you know, put them in a, in a position where even when they consciously didn't do something, it was already on their interest not to change it, right? Because a lot of those changes actually, like you said, would make them smaller, right? Actually allow them to be in a place where either they can be regulated or the platform doesn't have some of the properties, right? Because, you know, and I, I think what, what, what is interesting, if you look at, you know, even what happened this week, right, with the events, there's clearly as an asymmetry of, of the people, you know, what when they do an action and then they see the consequences and they realize, well, I didn't realize that this is what was happening. I didn't realize that this was the reality of, of, of the situation. And I think it, online, it's, it's very easy to put a lot more trust on certain elements because they all look the same. It's kind of like when you put, you know, two, you know, two, two, you know, two individuals defending a topic and this topic has 97%, you know, sort of, acceptance by everybody and this has this is a fringe idea of three percent but when you put them side by side what you're actually doing is you're elevating the fringe to a level of credibility they actually shouldn't deserve because you know that is a, a very fringe idea Absolutely. and i think a lot of platforms yeah. 
you know, they, you know, um, they, they didn't regulate themselves enough. And now they, they created a monster, right? They created these radicalization engines, which have, you know, a lot of interesting side effects, but they only, go, it's almost like they good side effects when, when the best players are not also <laughs> playing the same system, right? When, when you have the big players not knowing how the game works, those platforms I think can be very effective. When you have big players being one of the biggest players, in a, in, in, a, in a way, in your in your you know sort of courtyard analogy, right? That courtyard works as long as the majority of the play of the people in the courtyard are actually benign and are actually have good intentions, or you know they're not being manipulated or they're not in that, in that place. So well, you've the got the big guys who actually own the speakers that are amplifying the voices in the courtyard. Yeah. That the guys who are out there having the normal conversations, they can just stand on a box. Yes, correct. Like Tor, right? Tor gives you anonymity, right? Only if nobody controls a majority of the Tor nodes, right? If somebody controls a large number of Tor nodes, now you can actually start to correlate things in a way that maybe you shouldn't. Yeah, so I mean, people this is the ultimate conclusion of the free market you find ways to leverage the side effects of the technologies that you've brought into a product state mm -hmm. and at some stage the excesses that the pure profit motive bring um will bring harms at a scale that you need to then regulate to limit that that excess from but if you're in a situation where the enforcement bodies are not sufficiently technologically advanced and don't have the infrastructure to enforce, so they go and knock on the door of the people they're trying to enforce to say, can you please do your best to do better? Um, we know that doesn't work. Um, oh, and ad tech is kind of an indivisible part of this um, because ad tech is the vehicle by which the data gets aggregated and monetized and yeah. and reused for private and public purposes. So it's not entirely in the um, public sector enforcement bodies' interests to lose that infrastructure at that ubiquitous and full coverage scale. So we have a lot of things, pulleys and levers going on right now. But I I don't believe I think we've overtaken the ability to voluntarily regulate the harms down to a tolerable level now but well, i don't think that we need six more laws that say the internet is bad without defining bad or without being able to regulate without multiplying harms through the monitoring well, well if you take that to you know the online harms um you know protecting young people etc yeah Not kind of very very little has kind of been done um one of the kind of big social media companies over COVID decided that they couldn't do monitoring because their monitoring staff, it was so dreadful, the staff they had to look at couldn't do it from home. So that kind of means that our young people have to kind of be unprotected. But when it kind of comes to, a, you know, I won't kind of call it a minor issue that kind of flares up everywhere, yeah, instantly something's done about it. So it's kind of like, what? Well, why aren't we protecting kind of people that really need protection uh, and do it quickly? I think when it comes to, to kids as well, you've got you've got a double-edged sword here in a lot of ways as well. I I talk a lot to a couple of people who are very specifically in protection of children from um, being groomed and from the fallout from child sexual abuse activities, primary tertiary, supplementary activities associated with that. Um, and we, we always have a, a very fraught conversation around end-to-end -end encryption in that space. Um, obviously, end-to-end -end encryption protects people from undue surveillance. It also protects people who are victim of um, domestic violence from being uh, stalked. It also protects people who are activists. It protects whistleblowers. I said, I never want to get into a conversation where I say one abused child is greater or lesser than one abused woman um, or one person who is trying to to escape or um, raise a, being crushed from raising a diplomatic, uh, sorry, a democratic protest against a, a heinous regime. Um, there is no sweet spot here, is there though, David? Let's face it, there is only the properly weighted tension on both sides that isn't brought out by lobbying interests. We, we have to be able to have an equally weighted conversation on both sides to balance this out. This is why, Dennis, in the first session, I was, I was very 
hotly outspoken about the fact that we can technically solve this so nobody can access the data, but we have to permit properly warranted legal access to the data. Yeah. So we haven't solved it if we've just given the person who's in control of the data no means to hand it over. We've just put them in the position where they're probably going to jail. Um, because for the situations that Dave is talking about, for children, protecting children, dealing with bona fides, national security threats, there should be access. Yeah, but then now you have those catch 22s right? That if you create a system that has built-in vulnerabilities, right? Or has built-in backdoors, then who controls that? Yeah, nobody believes in breaking maths um, or pretending maths doesn't exist that I've spoken to, not even the chap whose life's work is reducing the incidence of abuse of children online. Um, I, that was one of the first things I said to him. I said, I don't want to, I don't want to have a fight with you. I really want to understand your position. Presumably you think that there, we should have a backdoor for encryption. And he said, no, I don't. I think we need to find creative ways to grant us specifically warranted access to material that we need to, to forward investigations. I think that, that it does both parties a disservice when people are hiding behind paedophiles and terrorists to enable bulk surveillance for not very well-defined purposes. Yeah, I I'll agree with you. I, and and, and I, I think I think it is, is at the edges that the activity is occurring, right? It's, it's, I always found that it's, it's the side effects of what you're doing that are, are almost the biggest signals that you should be catching, right? And, and like you said, mass surveillance, we, I, I think we even know that it doesn't work, right? Like I think there's been large mass surveillance efforts, right? And, and the, the noise that it creates, right? And, and, the, and, and the impact that it does. And I think there's also the problem of once somebody has access to that, what can they do, right? And, yeah. and, I, is, and I, is there capability to handle the quantity of data that you're taking to produce useful results at that scale? So there's very much that element but we get as well. Where now we're starting to have that capability, right? Which is, which is where we, the problem becomes very real. Right, and, yes. and who controls the data and who accesses the data is, I think, a, a very big question, which is kind of the heart of what we're talking about here, right? Who should have access to the data? Who controls the data? And in a way, what are the entities that we trust to access the data all the time? And what are the entities that we don't want to be able to access the data, right, without our consent? Well, the big thing is also is this right to redress. It's very much the core of what Schrems was about. Yeah. It's that the checks and balances are what we all have to lean upon. There will be, there will be situationally specific overreach of what we would ideally like to happen if there's a heightened threat. There may also be a bad interpretation of law by law enforcement where they take more data than they should have had and they cause someone harm or someone ends up on a list they should really shouldn't be on and get disadvantaged as a result. The, the failing that's really been found is if that happens, people have nowhere to go. They really have no real hope within an affordable amount of money and a reasonable amount of time to seek redress to the same extent they would be able to do in Europe. And, and that's really at the crux of a, a lot of the debates about surveillance. They've put in uh, investigatory powers tribunals the, the oversight authorities and bodies and the effectiveness of that of dealing with exceptions is really where this falls down so do you think europe is actually going on a correct direction with these challenges and with the, the way they're thinking about some of the solutions i think it's or it's going to create another problem I think we are not, we have not got the solutions for the problems that we've outlined right now. I think, uh, I actually think the kind of technical solutions that you're pulling out in these sessions are going to push the conversations in better directions. Um, in the same way that Apple versus FBI surfaced and focused minds on, it isn't just for one bloke for one purpose, is it? If you, if you get this, this facility is going to be forever. Oh, and look, when we dug our heels in, you found a different way to do it. 
um, you ended up with the end point and got in with whatever your, you, what are the boxes now that have been supposed to be, I'm thinking about what the name of them are. The boxes you can plug a phone into and it just sucks all the content out. Anyway, um, yeah, so there are ways around. Yep. Um, but the ways around require you to have done very targeted police work, which is what they're arguing isn't feasible to do without bulk access to data. Yeah. You can't whittle down. You're always going to catch somebody in the net, but if you're keeping everybody's data just in case they might be a baddie, that's where the human rights infringement comes in. That's it. That's presumption of guilt until proven innocence. Yeah. And the irony, right, is actually if you have less data, but a lot more high quality data and a lot more focused data, and you're very good at digest those pieces of information, and sometimes that, that sometimes can be very useful. Yeah, I mean, the, the dirtiness of the data, the difficulty in labeling it and putting it into any format that produces reliable results has been a massive part yeah. of the counter argument to do you really need it? There is a desperate sense of FOMO in, in law enforcement that, you know, we need to have this just in case. Um, and there's an argument that, you know, you've got the sat nav effect where, where a lot of pre-existing solid policing and investigatory skills are um, being run down because of the over expectation of being able to solve it with bulk data analysis. Um, that's, I'm really, I'm talking a little bit outside my lane now. I mean, I mean, I'm talking about hearsay with people I talk to in that world. So um, I'm going to shush now. But I guess also part of it is when, when the kind of Human Rights Act was kind of declaration of human rights, I think there was like something like 10 million phones in the world is kind of very, very kind of trivial. People kind of thought governments were, the, were one of the main kind of issues for collecting data. And actually now it's kind of changed. It's, it's big tech collects the data and governments use the big tech data to kind of deal with their issues. It's not directly the governments collecting the data or even kind of analyzing it. Yeah, and facial recognition is another element of this that's bringing it very much to the fore right now. That's that, That's that got a similar kind of effect as the bulk data, which is that we all know it's horrifically inaccurate for a certain subsets of, of faces and skin tones, etc. cetera. Um, well, the argument is if data, it gets more, yeah. yeah, if it gets more data, it'll get more accurate. But what's the fallout in the interim? Um, well, 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 it's not just data, it's kind of understanding the content, because if you if you kind of look at data in the world now, the worst place to be is in hospital because you could die. And and that's what the data says, but actually that's kind of in context, it's actually not true. You go because yeah. you are ill, but the building itself is not the, the, the kind of trigger for you kind of being ill. So yeah, so were you are you logging the false because the false positives and false negatives? Uh, Somebody was making the yeah, their key is wrong. Yeah, you, you're, people are keeping evidence of alerts on facial recognition, even if the alert is to say that it was a false negative. Um, so you end up with a point um, on a scheme that may then raise you to a level where you're flagged as a greater risk for the next time. Um, and also, are you using facial recognition in low de high deprivation areas, which are have typically had more crime and therefore it's going to validate your findings? by that situational context. And, and it's also things. the metadata around that data, because, you know, they, 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 I think kind of one of the stories was that, you know, Enigma won the kind of war for the Allies, but actually it was the metadata around the encryption data that was probably more useful because you could see encrypted data being transmitted from someplace in Europe. They knew there was activity there. So that was kind of real time. Yeah, we need to focus on this area. Uh, and, and, and I think we're kind of seeing the same with, you know, encrypted channels, you know, like, like WhatsApp, it's the metadata around that. They might not know what you're talking about, but they know what phone you have, they know where you are. They kind of, you know, know a whole load of other stuff around it. And, and the metadata around the actual data can be just as kind of inverted commas useful. Actually, on, the same, on that same point, we were talking about, you were talking, Dennis, about the fact that where does where does the nefarious goings on actually happen? Um, the point was made at the Open Rights Conference a couple of years ago that um, by by somebody from the government that they they know the effect that happens when they close down access to certain forums, when they make it more difficult 
or they open up encryption on certain forums, that the fact of people's movement off those forums, you know, you're not after the clumsy people who don't give a monkeys that you've just binned end-to-end -end encryption on a forum. You keep an eye on the people who leap onto mm. the, the better encrypted forums. So if you make it um, less palatable for people who are not seeking extreme privacy to go on to end-to-end -end, end encrypted forums, it, it actually gives you a subset of people to help you target in itself. Yeah. So if you go back to terms two, yes. what, what are the four questions that we would like to answer next month? Dida, can you capture them as we create them? So what, what, what are four things that we don't know now that, that we want to know in the next couple of months? Is what's knowable or what we'd like to know? What we would like to know. We want to know whether the UK is going to get an adequacy agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and if we if it doesn't get an adequacy agreement, we need to know on what grounds, because that drives all the conversations about what supplementary measures might be needed. Yeah. And that then drives a conversation about what technical solutions would produce essential equivalent protection if technical measures can over and above SCCs. Yeah. Because I think technical measures, although possible, I think they, they're going to be really tough at this moment in time um, to kind of do a full one, which kind of means, is there going to be any kind of arrangement with the US kind of legally that they kind of manage this in a certain way? Um, and that will be, be the nicest outcome because then we, we won't have to worry about kind of changing providers. Because I think, you know, once you're embedded with a provider, it's really hard because, you know, you talk to companies and you go, well, you're kind of with company X. Why do you, you know, in the kind of good old days, you always had more than one provider in case things went wrong. No one does that anymore. They go, we're with this kind of humongous company and we're going to kind of stay because it's so complex what we do and they don't translate to what other providers are doing. So, that, you know, the cost of kind of moving is, is, is huge. Could be, you know, it could destroy the company. Well, that was one of the questions I had was how long, if things go bad, how long is expected a company have, for example, to move a provider? Let's say if we can't use AWS, are we saying that, you know, will at least, you know, companies be giving 12 months, six months to move things around, right? I think government departments in some, some European countries have been asked to do it kind of now i don't know if they've actually achieved it but i think they were asked to to move away from that at the moment there's no there's no uh, grace period um there being no official grace period and the likelihood of you getting fines or sanctions for not moving are two totally separate conversations i think the likelihood of fines kind of is a, a bit strange really because our regulatory authority is based on uh, Microsoft and our cabinet office is based on G Suite so kind of the mere fact we're talking to both of them it's a bit like us being on Zoom we're already probably got one one foot a bit warm. I wonder what the geopolitical ambitions are as well because there's I mean there was very much that influencing the time scale for the Schrems decision they were looking at what was happening with the American election and with Brexit. Um, they've also got tenders out for creating European clouds and UK mm -hmm. clouds. Yeah. They're so, not so, going to drive uh, people to those unless they draw a really hard line and look like they're going to enforce it. Well, yeah. And, and sorry, I, I was, my internet had some issues and I missed part of the conversation. So I apologize. I heard that it was all about government access to data, which is like one of my areas. So I'm really bummed that I missed that part of the conversation. <laughs> well, I, we probably, probably <laughs> could have really done with your perspective. I've been enjoying Absolutely. it. <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to come back to that now. Maybe there's time afterwards, but um, I could talk all about the history of the third party doctrine in the United States and the Stored Communications Act, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, Section 72 of the Five Amendments Act, and the Cloud Act. But that's what you're um, but uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting to me as I'm seeing this is when I was a tech consultant in the late 2000s, early, early mid 2007, 2008, 2009, everything was on-prem, right? We were doing server virtualization to consolidate boxes into a, a big virtual machine um, or a series of virtual machines inside of a server. And so then um, we started to see Microsoft pushing software assurance, which was essentially software license insurance. So as long as you paid the subscription fees, you'd get the new version, which was sort of weaning us onto this whole cloud-based. So are we gonna 
after seeing this big movement to push everything to the cloud, are we going to see people kind of going in and pulling their data and now hosting it all on prem so that we don't run into this potential, some of these potential issues regarding government intrusion, regarding compliance, because you don't necessarily where your server farms are. If you're using AWS, I know you can specify via region, but now is this going to have some sort of implication with when you sign a contract with one of these that only my data will be on servers in this particular jurisdiction and that you're going to be violating the terms of use that you offer me if all of a sudden I find out that some of my data is being backed up to a jurisdiction outside of where I have agreed to. And then the question is, how am I going to ensure that if I'm working at a company with a deal where they say, don't worry, all your stuff will be on a server in Ireland, for instance, how do I know that some of it, am I going to have to have some sort of audit ability to see that? Are there going to be some sort of dashboards or tools that I can use where a company would specifically tell me, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a technologist. So, you know, do, do the tech people see that as becoming a thing now? Whereas part of my contract, not only do I have standard contractual clauses with respect to the provider that's in one of these jurisdictions, but they also now guarantee me um, with an audit capability that the data isn't going to touch or concern any of these other jurisdictions or anything even asymptotic to it. Well, AWS is going that direction, right? If you look yeah. at AWS outposts, for example, you got, do you know what that is? Sounds like they're geolocating according to order. No, 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 no. So uh, AWS Outpost is basically, it's literally a physical data center that a physical rack that gets shipped to your data center or whatever you want it to be. And basically you plug, it literally you just bring, bring your own network, right? Do you plug, the, bring power, bring network? I heard about it, okay. And it's, it's literally physical. And, and they, it's, I think it's a really interesting move because I think in one way is, is AWS finish eating up the lunch of the ISPs, right? Of the, the big, sort of service providers that completely were, were MIA, right? When, um, you know, when everything was moving to the cloud, they didn't realize that they already had the data centers and they, if they had, or, you know, if they had invested in infrastructure in automation and services, they could have done the same thing, right? And now the, the, the kind of the, the AWS, but also Azure is doing, and, and I think I'm not sure about Google Cloud, but some of the others are thinking of it, but the, the, the idea here is that is they now ship you a mini data center that has all the software, right? Has the box in a box. Environment, right? mm. Yeah, it's a closed box, right? So, mm. so the interesting about that is, is now super powerful for running workloads that almost the, the network cost of sending it to the cloud was too big, but also allows the data to actually reside physically in your environment, right? But so are they administering that and orchestrating that from America still? Well, but... That's an interesting thing, right? Because they're using the same software, but AWS on, in, in October recently just open sourced some of the components. Okay. Right? But open source doesn't change, but even if it's open source, doesn't mean that it's still not being controlled by the Yeah, US who can do it though? You still need the skills to do it. Yeah, uh, unless, unless you're in the US and you're sending mouse clicks and keyboard strokes to Ireland yeah, and you have a person. It, 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 not, sorry, Iceland. You have a person here looking at it and going yeah, but, here. And <laughs> but they are ensuring themselves again this mode, right? Yeah. Because they are, you know, but basically the, the game plan is to say, look, there's a lot of other stuff that is going, right, in, in the local data center. And they now want to start being involved in that, right? And there's a reason why some of those stuff exists in the local data center, right? Now, I think at the moment, Yes, it's still connected to the to the main to the mission to the Borg, right? It's still, but but it's also for usability purposes, right? Because it feels like, in a way, they give a unified experience to the to the to the customer. But but that this is the hard part, right? If you think about it, the jump from here to say no, there's an air gap, right? Or or there's a very control audited path between what goes in, right, into those machines. Especially if some of them, like actually, ironically, they did open source. If some of those things start to be open source components, then you don't even need to go to the official AWS thing. You go to the open source project that is being the software that you use. But it means that they're already going to that idea that, you know, your data center or the, the one that is in your building, for example, if you want to maintain it, can actually have the same infrastructure. So, so you can actually move almost to AWS Lite right instead of having the main one and, and and it's almost like this although this is feature limited is already way better than for example the first couple of versions of aws when they came out so it's well, but you're saying but you're, you're sorry but you're saying it's it's aws light on bring your own device so no, i go buy bring your own no no yeah. it's almost like bring bring, bring amazon's your, device into your data center no, but you're, you're talking about, but you're saying two different things. You're saying that Amazon can, you can buy like a rack in a box, like a box in a box, 
but then yeah. you're also talking about they're open sourcing the software itself. So because that because I think and the reason why I think that the open source is relevant is because it means that you know, and I think that was one of the questions you had, Sarah. That do they control all the software that goes inside that environment, right? Or or do they have remote access to that environment? Yeah, but because I mean, I'm just thinking you. It's second nature to you, Dennis, because of the world you're in with with development. You understand the full stack that you look after, or you have a man next to next who you can get on the phone, or a woman who you can get on the phone who 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 does. Um, whereas the lion's share of businesses that I've been dealing with in financial services and and charity sector and everything, they wouldn't have a Scooby Doo where to start. And I think it's in it's in the more traditional product and service industry that don't have a dev element to what they do or a software house element to what they do where this is the biggest issue is where um they they don't understand any of their boxes unless they've got it stuff to run them and in most cases they outsource to an it service company mm -hmm. and in most cases those it service companies for some element of the support whether it's the telephony or the platform as a service or the SaaS that sits on top it's going to come from another country or the other or the company that you primarily outsource your IT service to has got their service center in India or they wherever in the world um that's that's the headache how are we keeping the full stack of both tin software and service to support it within those geographical boundaries because that's what we're being asked to do yeah. it's exactly. one of the big Sorry, I was going to say one of the kind of complexities is if you want to use encryption and you use Amazon encryption, eventually they have the master key. And the benefit of using that is that you can do highly high availability stuff across country, across their data centers, and it's really straightforward. Once you're kind of going back to your, your kind of rack in the wherever it is, you suddenly don't have that kind of availability thing kind of managed for you. So you've then got to either manage your own encryption or then use Amazon encryption to kind of get that, get that to kind of work smoothly. You can use your keys on KMS, I think, right? Yeah, no, but I think they eventually go back to the HSMM, HSM, which is managed by Amazon. Well, but I think that we've seen a modularization, right, of a lot of different things. And I think that even though there are some people with expertise you know, Sarah mentioned to people with the kind of uh, idea of the full stack and what it looks like. There are a lot of, I know a lot of small businesses shops on the high street where someone's niece or nephew does their website for them. And this niece or nephew is a grad student and they use Shopify or Magento or one of the other platforms. And they know nothing about this, right? So as with most regulations and regulatory approaches that the large companies are going to be able to weather the regulatory storm. Yeah. And it's the small businesses without the full grasp of this. I mean, you have all these instances where, where people put stuff on it, uh, you know, AWS servers that aren't secured. And you find out there's a huge data breach because some local insurance company was storing all this information. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I um, we, we were talking before about kind of the penalty, potential penalties for non-compliance and what do we do? And um, I think this is where I might've gotten disconnected. Um, and I don't know <laughs> if we're ready to go back to that. But it does seem to me that from a normative perspective, until we have some enforcement on this, it's hard to see what the risk is. And some of these things, aren't, and I say this as a lawyer, they aren't necessarily legal decisions, but business decisions. Because if I'm in-house somewhere or advising and they ask me, oh, should I do this or should I shouldn't? I lay it out for them, but I say, look, um, it is not necessarily a criminal act to be in non-compliance. It is a violation of rules and you could be fined, but you as the C-suite or whatever need to make the business decision as to whether or not the risk associated with non-compliance is worth the cost of implementing it. And that's not my decision as a lawyer to make, that's your decision as the people who run the business to make. And, the, and, and it's lawyers like um, you that leave me sitting in house as the data protection professional going, oh great, you've just made me the one who has to decide how, which way we go in this and they're gonna pin it on me now, <laughs> you risk averse. <laughs> anyway, no, no, that's really interesting to hear because it is how it often goes. I'm. I'm used to being the legal tiebreaker sitting between lawyers and techies as a non-legal person. Um, and I do that with risk. Mm -hmm. So um, where you say that non-compliant doesn't necessarily equal a league, then the, the deciding point is usually risk. Well, yes, exactly. And a lot of legal decisions are based on risk because there's a difference between something being illegal and something being unlawful. 
Yeah, and I mean, right. I'm, when I'm talking about risk, I'm not talking about risk of a final sanction. I'm talking about risk to data subjects. So I'm talking right. about risk to availability and to data subjects, mm -hmm. either in terms of harm to data, so it's not usable or it's damaged or it's corrupted or, or actual second order, first or second order harms to, to individuals as a result of compromise of that data or perfectly law, lawful, secure processing of a data that itself causes harms, mm -hmm. which is the element we tend to forget where, yeah, we actually the intended to do all this stuff. Oops, we didn't expect this to happen, which is quite topical right now. Um, so what I, I, I've had a, a few conversations recently, specifically around anonymization, actually, where we, we have perhaps an illustrative situation with anonymization where you have the people who very much understand the statistical side of de-identifying something down to the level of nobody, even with stunt hacking and supercomputers being able to re-identify anyone where we might agree we can call it anonymous. And then you have the more pragmatic view of a lesser risk-based judgment that we can call as anonymous and therefore out of scope of the GDPR because anon anonymity is the benchmark for being out of scope. In that scenario, it may only be that you can re-identify 10 individuals out of a data set of a number of thousands after quite considerable effort that not a big subset of the attacker community could expend, but you would still potentially fall foul of a regulator should they choose to investigate, but you probably wouldn't fall foul to the extent of being fined or sanctioned. You would fall foul to the extent that they would may formally investigate if it became newsworthy and the fact of the investigation would tank your reputation and you would kick off if you were a high enough profile company the whole techie conversation on Twitter where they said it's anonymous based on risk and then the tech community goes nothing's ever anonymous and then you go it was a reasonable risk and they go no it's never anonymous and 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 it's all noise and it's all reputation risk. So the conversations have been in the same context as Schrems we need to show good faith effort to work towards understanding the risk of all our relative connections and third parties. We need to look at how much data, how sensitive the data is, which countries, how many third parties involved. A lot of those benchmarks are actually, and if you dig for them in pre-existing EDPB guidance, European Data Protection Board guidance, and in the more recent stuff. So we've been giving a heat map type score, counting up all the inherent risk indicators to see who we move with first and how far we go because we feel that if we can't move immediately, that's a mitigation in itself as an exercise. But we sent a shot across the bows of all those organizations saying, we're gonna to have to move onto this new basis as soon as feasible, as soon as we're sure you're gonna to need to move. So we've put them on notice. So that's the kind of approach we're taking. But we're still in a position where the, the, the the subset of residual risk in that is the fact that they've pretty much said for those people who are categorically in scope for um, 702 and 12333, then there's nothing can mitigate it until redress is fixed. So what I like about what you're saying, and I think is is quite cheeky, right? Because you basically let me let me let me re say what I what I'm hearing, right? Is that at the moment we don't have good technical or even political solutions for this, right? And, and as we explored for the last couple of sessions, it gets very messy very quickly using David's favorite example that even the UK government runs on all of this stuff, right? So you can't peel this off, right? Now, we don't have good technical solutions because you know it, it's, it's still a, a big mess, right? Um, again, using David's example, who controls the keys and all that stuff. But the solution or the, the solution in the, in the short and medium term is that if you have a good understanding of your risk, if you have a good understanding of your of your data and your flows and what happens, and you made conscious business decisions that you can back up based on you know data and a good understanding and a good awareness, then that is good. That puts you in a very, in a way that reduces the risk of litigation, the risk of disruption, and actually prepares you for whatever comes next. 
Yes. Which actually is making the case, which I completely agree, actually, I really like it, which is the solution is for us to really understand how the business works, how the data flow works, how the data is being used, how the data is being transferred, how the data is being protected, which is, which is things that are all within the control of a company. And we but should have known already, but anyway, but yes. Very few companies do it. And a lot of companies started that way with GDPR, because if you read the GDPR properly, it forces you to do that, then realize that unfortunately there was not a lot of stick on it. There was, there was a lot of stuff on paper, but in practice, you could start to get away with a lot. And I think most companies you know, lo lost interest after a while. And you went back to the whole thing of, oh, we just use this service and that service and we don't map that and that's legacy. And I don't understand how that works and all that jazz. And then don't, do, don't have formal risk frameworks. And I also think that it is not helped by the fact that we still don't have a good scalable solution for how to manage risk, unless yes. you found one. I, I, what, I've, what I've been working on is a good scalable simple solution for triaging risk. Yeah. Because that there are there are three distinct elements to managing risk. Historically it has been take a list of things, be it servers or transfers or third parties or whatever, do a NIST or ISO 27001 or ISF assessment on those, ask them hundreds of questions, largely take the answers for granted, and then put it in a drawer. Yep. That has been risk management in a yep. lot of places historically. Yep. Whereas I've also been party to proper audit standard assessment where you not only ask about controls, you check the design adequacy, you check the operational effectiveness, you go back again after an amount of time to check it's still working. You collect evidence, you have formal sampling quantities that you take of yep. evidence of how they dealt with a breach, how they did due diligence on a third party, how they dealt with vulnerabilities. No, that doesn't scale though. That just full stop, 100% does not scale. So you either have lots of money to get a third party to do it for you, or you triage for what you point that effort at. And I thought the path, the place I could actually affect change was in triage. It was asking simple, quick sets of questions that could be answered by third parties, not specialists, because you don't have enough specialists even to triage, yeah. to then get at the stuff you really, really need to kick the tires hard. Mm -hmm. And I well, think, and the, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, no, but that seems like a fantastic, um, in many ways, probably proactive way to identify and, and then take positive steps to mitigate risk. But the question I would have is, in the event of something going wrong, then you also have documentation in a sense about what sort of steps were or were not taken. Yes. And when it comes to the lawyers, sorry, everybody, you know, um, there, there are things about constructive notice. And so depending on the context, there are elements where you can say, oh, we, we were uh, industry standards, we applied what was customary at the time. And as a consequence, that could be a defense in the event of some types of liability, uh, civil yeah. or otherwise. But then all of a sudden, if you're on notice that something wasn't adequate as to the standard and you chose to do nothing, um, then you could actually expose yourself to tremendous liability. So from yeah. a regulatory perspective, a lot of these things become a ceiling, not a floor. And that a lot of lawyers say, no, no, I don't want to know if it's not up to snuff because then we're liable. We should just carry on uh, with our heads in the sand um, because you know, at the end of the day, if we just do what everybody else does, we're not likely to be pulled over for speeding if we're in the middle of the pack, so to speak. Now, in the United what, States. Yeah, but that's- I just want to quickly- what, Sorry, just I just want to quick, sorry, quick yeah, go, go ahead, Dennis, sorry. Say, that's what got into the mess that we are now. That exact yes. attitude that exactly. it's better not to know than yep. to know is exactly what the, the, the IT industry, especially IT, some, a lot of risk, a lot of security, right? Even a lot of, even I, general, I, general IT has been doing by, you know, almost grabbing this model where it's better for people not to know and they, even when they tacitly don't do that, there, there's this sort of lack of investment. There's this lack of curiosity. There's this, mm -hmm. you know, you know a, a good example I always say is that when, when there's a breach or a problem, we shouldn't look at the business model of the attacker to understand how bad it was, right? We should look at actually what was the real consequences, what could have happened, and what, what, what would have been the other scenarios to learn from this, right? And a lot of other industries do this, right? They are a lot we of look other at near misses in financial services. Absolutely, yeah. right? Like when, when well, they're, they're also heavily regulated financial services. 
right? I mean, there yes. are international conventions, there's a financial right. action task force, there are all kinds of things regarding all types of other things involved. And I'm glad you brought up financial services because it seems to me that the framework we're moving toward globally would be to have certain types of legislative um, approaches which create the same type of somewhat regulatory elements around data privacy and cybersecurity. For instance, KYC, know your customer due diligence, which any party in financial services is going to be accustomed to. Yep. Um, why don't we have KYC standards when it comes to selling or sharing data with third parties? Yes. It would be very simple. And I can't say which new uh, state in the United States, but new legislation is going to be introduced very soon, if it has not already, which introduces elements of KYC due diligence for data stuff. It also has things about uh, anonymized data and rules around white hats who are de-anonymizing information and steps that they could take to notify the appropriate data protection individual within a company of the risk to vulnerable anonymized data. It also is going to have provisions that would make it a misdemeanor crime to de-anonymize data. And then it would make it potentially a felony for uh, soliciting the de-anonymization and trading in a de-anonymized data. Oh, I like that. So, so this is going to be hopefully introduced in the next few days. Um, hopefully when it is introduced, people will pay attention to it. It is a major state in the United States that's looking to tackle this stuff. Um, but I think that we're gonna see more of the lessons learned from regulating in the financial services world, some of which we might be able to point back to the introduction of the gap accounting standard um, so that you can have an apples to apples comparisons. And one of the reasons yep. that we trust when a company signs off on their books is a third party comes in and performs an audit, as Sarah mentioned. So as we move to maybe even audit standards for privacy that become nationalized, not necessarily in the sense of government takes them over, but recognized by national authority, you might then be able to have an apples and apples comparison to privacy elements, as well as data um, transparency and privacy practices. Sorry, I see that's yeah, I've got something there. else on that, actually. There's a, the, other, the other point where I felt that there had to be movement was in economies of scale with assessment because um, the way I always approach it is there are big providers that it's absolutely ridiculous to expect an internal team to do due diligence on because you'd be there all year if you've got your main IT outsource partner and you're expected to properly risk assess that you outsource that one but that that in a big company can cost you a hundred grand to do at least the first time the delta maybe not um and anybody below big corporate scale you're not going to knock on Wipro's door and say i i would like three of days of your time to show around you know my garage business from the midlands <laughs> that's not going to happen um so you've got folk like there's um a guy called hayden who runs a company called risk ledger where one of the approaches that he's he's doing is um, starting up what he's terming a, a social network for assessees and assessors. So you, with, this is something I recommended way back in the day, but I'm, I'm not as 30 under 30 as he is. Um, so he <laughs> um, has the economies of scale of having a decent assessment as a cost of doing business. It may not be the assessment you would have wanted to do, but you're going to reduce your assessment burden by about 80%. You can nibble around the edges if you're more risk averse and they can grant you more or less access depending on who you are. So everyone gains a level of assurance and, and it also starts to map out supply chains because if people are being put in touch with the next person down their supply chain, the next person again down the supply chain will be able to see the assessments that were shared between the first two layers of the supply chain and in the matrix i can see you guys get it because you're nodding oh, yeah, and like grinning fourth, but fourth uh, party fifth party yes yeah and also the matrix relationship um i mean i got my daughter's crayons out to try and illustrate this to someone <laughs> you know you've got i i had a guy from the the Bax organization um mm. who runs the sort of banking intermediary platform that's pretty ubiquitous and the poor guy looked like he'd been beaten up and sent through a spaghetti grinder. And because he was dealing with about 28 different flavors of assessments with between 300 and 1,000 questions from about 650 different customers who all were asking pretty much the same thing with about the same risk appetite, who couldn't have gone to another provider if they wanted to. Now, something was very, very wrong with that picture. Um, this kind of economies of scale and shared burden of assessment, there was, I think, BITS, British, there, there, was a, there was a British industry body that tried to do this, but it didn't 
get off the ground to try there are and... there are some commercial companies who do yeah. like assessments on your behalf and once you're on the platform you can already see the assessments that have been done and you can do delta assessments if you don't see it which is, and stuff. which is exactly what we're talking about some of those though are external ones where they're doing essentially company osint on it which only gives you yeah, bit, an bit amount of layers deep yes yeah. Yeah, they do um, for like the website of the company they check yeah. uh, the technical so it's a little bit of a temperature security. tape before you actually say put them in a short lift list for down selection depending mm -hmm. on what you're engaging them for whereas i'm thinking more about the sas2 type 2 mm -hmm. deep well, dive risk analysis mm -hmm. scale right so, and i think that's super critical mm -hmm. I, I i actually need to jump but you guys can can stay either can 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 wrap up in, mm -hmm. in a bit i um, but the, the thing I really like is, is this idea that the thing that we can do proactively, even on TREMS too, and maybe that's a question to ask is, is a more thorough risk understanding and a risk mapping the best way to mitigate again possible TREM2 problems in the medium term? Right? Uh, I, that's I, something that we can do versus some of the technology things that we're talking about, which is all great, but just about everybody's going to wait and see what the hell happens, right? You build the business case for your technology by doing the risk piece. Yeah. No, exactly. Because what, what ends up happening is that from a normative perspective, these are not necessarily strict liability offenses. In other words, you could still run afoul of one of the provisions, uh, even following the Trump's two case, and, might, and maybe not find it all if you cooperate with investigators and show that you've been acting in good faith to try to mitigate or address the concerns. So by taking positive steps to implement a framework that does risk analysis, if you do for some reason get dinged or, or investigated by one of these DPAs to show that you've been proactively doing things would go a long way to mitigate any potential danger to the business or otherwise. Well, the other one that happened recently, just I need to go, uh, that um, is very relevant is, the, I don't, did you notice that the solar wind board has been sued by the shareholders? by saying that you didn't tell us the reality of the situation. Yeah. And we lost all the money because most of the times the companies get hacked, the share price goes down, but then recovers. So after a while, nobody cares. But because the price has been low, I think that's also another interesting game changer because they, what, what should have happened is now there's a real cost for not knowing, right? What's going to ha what happened, what was going on, right? We can talk about this uh, next time, but there, uh, that's a great example to bring up. And there's a lot of instances where shareholders try to sue a board or a C-suite or uh, fiduciaries for violating some fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. In the U.S., the problem is that our Federal Trade Commission is supposed to set standards for data privacy and have done a great job. The president, the seminal case, I think, is the 2015. I always get the year wrong. FTC, Federal Trade Commission versus Wyndham, where the hotel chain had edge appliances with default passwords, had breaches, didn't notify anybody. Everything they did was terrible. And they said, well, gosh, this is a due process violation because how can you hold this to a standard that has yet to be articulated by the Federal Trade Commission? And the court, I think it was the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit essentially said, no, your data privacy practices are so terrible. They are so below any industry standard that they would fall below anything the FTC might articulate <laughs> in the future. So as a consequence, you guys lose. All right, I'll see you guys later. Um, but let's continue this next, next month. Cool. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Did I, I'm gonna make it. Oh, you got the host. So cool. I am the host. Don't worry. <laughs> it is great. Great discussion. Um, lots to think about. I'm still not sure what that uh, AWS outpost is about. I'm gonna go and research <laughs> for it because it's really... I kind of got it. Yeah. It, it, when I was working in in the in the big insurance kind of world we actually went for a halfway house to Clyde when we outsourced to a big third party supplier where we actually gave them our data center and they built units of web service Same. for us and units of Oracle stacks for us. Yeah, and but units. That's, that's managed data center, but this time. Yes. But they were selling it, they were pricing it and selling it and, and ad managing it on the basis of it being um, a full stack box we could play for a unit of that kind of service and that's kind of analogous to what we're talking mm. about we're talking about mm. them shipping all the kit you could feasibly need to do everything you currently do on a aws but the platform as a service bit is also boundaried within that box yeah and infrastructure yeah the infrastructure as a service bit is in that is in that box as well because well, you have to have somewhere to well it has to be put somewhere appropriate somewhere with um 
appropriate air conditioning and appropriate access control, you're going to have to get your physical security hat on. It can't go under a desk. And your business continuity disaster recovery hat on, right? You're going to need redundant air cooling. You'll need two of them, won't you? Power, UPS. Yeah, exactly. In in multiple countries, yeah. (laughs) Well, well, it depends which countries, right? <laughs> That's the problem. Here's what it, we, we, we burn everything to the ground. We light our own fiber, put all these things in colo hotels, in sea land, you know, or tethered balloons. Yeah, that was the, that was the idea last time, wasn't it? Yeah. Balloons. I like our balloons, like up. Only yeah, for that, servers. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I want my balloons to be red. <laughs> <laughs> probably get there in 10 years with all these uh, um, satellite uh, connections and stuff we'll yeah, it'll probably be under the sea won't it because you know well, at least that will save on cooling um, I, think, I think red balloons is going to be high rate sarah i don't know i did actually i didn't, I didn't think through the color it's, I, <laughs> yeah i'm making no political statements with my <laughs> declaration of desire for red balloons um i was gonna say i think, I think that nena has dibs on is it nena, or nena <laughs> yeah. has dibs on red balloons would 99 uh, be enough oh, i don't know yeah. Yeah, 1980 something yeah mm. <laughs> i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> so, no, the, the german Luf pop song 99 luft balloons <laughs> oh yes yeah i know that song. yeah there we go <laughs> well, was that 86 can't remember <laughs> uh, did she actually say that they were red or was it just in the video anyway so they did she did <laughs> yeah. pretty sure great so do we want to continue or are we happy to wrap up? Yeah, we, we could wrap up and kind of do another one next month. Yeah. I think there's and kind of a load more we could kind of add to this. And I would really want to have a session about Sarah's triage of risks methodology. Just by all, by all really... means. It's not, there's no rocket science here. It's purely trying to make standard some of the common sense questions mm-hmm. that we can, we can ask of non-specialists in a way that we can analyze and have trends for later. And that helps all of the risk professionals in their day-to-day job. So uh, I think that will be a very valuable session to have as well. Cool, more than happy to. Thank you. Thank Thank you you. all. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks, Dita.